The War Cabinet has approved the IDF plan presented last night for a planned military action in Rafah. Prime Minister Netanyahu said that the plan could be delayed if a deal is struck for a hostage deal. According to Netanyahu, once the Rafah operation is launched, victory over Hamas will only be weeks away. More from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. The War Cabinet approved the IDF plan to first evacuate Palestinian civilians from Rafah and then destroy some of the last Hamas battalions in the area of Gaza near the Egyptian border. The cabinet also approved the plan to provide humanitarian assistance to the Gaza Strip in a way that will keep the aid out of the hands of Hamas. Some 1.3 million Gazans have taken refuge in Rafah after fleeing other areas where the IDF was operating. Rafah area would be evacuated before the start of the planned IDF operation. Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke with CBS's Face the Nation about the importance of a Rafah operation in ensuring an IDF victory over Hamas. Netanyahu said that whether the operation is before or after a hostage deal, Rafah must be taken. First to evacuate, to enable the evacuation of the Palestinian civilians in Gaza, and uh, obviously second, to destroy the remaining Hamas battalions. That gets us a real, real distance uh, to, towards the completion of our, our victory. And that, uh, we're not going to give it up. If we have a deal, it'll be delayed somewhat. Uh, but it'll happen. If we don't have a deal, we'll do it anyway. Uh, it has to be done because total victory is our goal and total victory is within reach, not months away, weeks away, once we begin the operation. Meanwhile, intense fighting in Gaza is ongoing. The IDF killed dozens of Hamas fighters and located weapons and rocket launchers during raids in and around Khan Yunus. The footage shows rocket launchers, explosives, grenades, cartridges, Kalachnikov rifles, and communications devices. One of the buildings was identified by the army as a medical laboratory. It goes commandos battled Hamas operatives in Khan Yunus in one encounter. The IDF says it goes troops using a drone spotted two gunmen hiding in a building. Following a lengthy gun battle during which the troops attempted to flush the suspects out of the structure with explosives, the two operatives were killed. In another incident, it goes troops spotted several Hamas operatives opening fire at them from a building and killed them. In the building, the IDF says the soldiers found the cache of weapons. Mediation talks on a hostage deal in exchange for a pause in Gaza fighting have renewed in Qatar. The White House expressed cautious optimism as temporary ceasefire talks resumed in Doha with mediators from Egypt, Qatar, the United States and Israel. More from ILTV's Ariella Lahiani. The framework for a mediated hostage for the pause in fighting deal was agreed to in talks in Paris over the weekend. But Hamas has yet to accept the framework and many details still need to be worked out. However, mediators believe there is a chance for success. The talks in Doha are reportedly focused on technical aspects, including the timing and mechanism of a potential deal, including the method of releasing hostages. According to media reports, the Paris framework provides for the release of some 40 hostages held in Gaza, including women, children, female soldiers, elderly and ill abductees, amid a pause in fighting of some six weeks in a tentative first stage. Prime Minister Netanyahu said a deal is far from certain. Well, I'm not sure of the exact duration, but I can tell you that we're all working on it. Uh, we want it. I want it. Because we want to liberate uh, the remaining hostages. We've already brought half of them back. And uh, I appreciate the effort, the combined effort of Israel, the United States, uh, to bring back the remaining hostages. I can't tell you if we'll have it, but uh, if Hamas goes down from its delusional claims and goes down, can bring them down to earth, then we'll have the progress that we all want. Netanyahu said an agreement can only come when Hamas drops what he has repeatedly called delusional demands. You know, it's, uh, it's too soon to say if, they're, uh, if they've abandoned them, but if they, they do abandon them and get into what you call the, uh, the ballpark, they're not even in, in the city, uh, they're in another planet. But if they come down to uh, a reasonable uh, 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 situation, then yes, we'll have a hostage. The framework includes the release by Israel of hundreds of Palestinian terror convicts. The Israeli media is reporting that the Prime Minister is demanding that prisoners with murder convictions would be deported directly from prison to Qatar and not to Gaza or Judea and Samaria, where they would join Hamas resistance. According to the reports, it's a new Israeli demand that has yet to be discussed with mediators during negotiations. 
Following the progress in hostage negotiations and the War Cabinet's approval of the operation in Gaza, journalist and JNS Jerusalem Bureau Chief Alex Tryman joins us to discuss the proposed terms of the deal. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start off by asking you what your thoughts are on the proposed hostage deal. Does it have the capacity to be a good deal? And should murderers be released even if they are sent to Qatar? Well, the government is looking at a way in which they can get hostages back. Uh, you, there three hostages have come back through uh, military operations, but 110 hostages came back earlier through negotiations. Israel's believed that by putting immense military pressure on Hamas, they could get uh, terms whereby they'd be willing to negotiate. And it looks as though there may be a window where Israel could get back up to 40 uh, of its hostages uh, through a, a six-week period of temporary ceasefire, which would mean that there would be no fighting in Gaza during the Islamic holy month of Ramadan, uh, and there would be the release of prisoners. Uh, and I think that Israelis have understood that uh, trading prisoners uh, in exchange for hostages, unfortunately, while that means negotiating with terrorists, has been uh, historically one of the most effective ways of getting hostages back. A lot of the pressure to make a deal has been rooted in a desire to pause the fighting for the Muslim holiday of Ramadan, something that has been brought up repeatedly. Why is this important, but there's not even a mention of the fact that Hamas launched this very war on a Jewish holiday? Exactly. Uh, I think, you know, what, what you said uh, makes a lot of sense. And uh, Ramadan, which is supposedly an Islamic holy month, has been a holy month historically for killing Jews in the land of Israel. I mean, Israel's at war right now. It's a war that uh, it did not seek. It was a war that was launched on a Jewish holy day. Uh, and, uh, you know, Israel has to make sure that they finish this war. Uh, they don't have an open-ended window to uh, finish the war from the international community. Not only that, but uh, any a cessation, even temporary, is going to put immense pressure on Israel not to restart uh, the military campaign, which is not finished. Uh, so I think that uh, the international community has been putting pressure on Israel not to uh, not to in further inflame what's already a, a situation which is on fire, which is a war during the month of Ramadan. They're hoping that uh, violence won't spill over uh, into Judea and Samaria, into Jerusalem, like we just saw a terror attack uh, in Israel a few days ago, a shooting attack at a checkpoint. Um, but uh, ultimately, Israel needs to do what it can to win the war and to win it as fast as possible. Uh, and, and pausing for Ramadan sounds nice, but it's not something that, uh, that the Muslims would do for Jews on their holy day. Absolutely. When it comes to the operation in Rafah, how likely is Israel to receive adequate international support? I mean, we already see the U.S. administration balking a little bit. Sure. The United States had put tremendous pressure on Israel and Netanyahu's government to pause before going into Rafah until they have a plan to move as many residents as possible out of Rafah. If you recall, Israel started its military campaign in the north, pushing as many residents as as possible into the south. Now the majority of Gaza's residents are in and around the Rafah area. Rafah is the southernmost city in Gaza bordering Egypt. And that's where most of the senior leadership is. That's where most of the hostages are at this point. Uh, now, obviously, Israel's tried to reduce the number of civilian casualties in the war. The problem is that uh, if Israel makes arrangements to allow for civilians to escape the war zone in Rafah, what will likely happen, as we saw already with the humanitarian corridors in the north, is that senior leadership and hostages will be smuggled out of Rafah using these very uh, tools that are supposed to be uh, reserved only for civilians. So it makes life much more difficult. But if Israel wants to have the support of the United States, they've had to present this credible plan to reduce civilian casualties in Rafah. Well, Alex Tryman, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your insights. Thank you so much for having me. Going forward, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant stated that Israel will increase its strikes on Hezbollah and will not stop, even if there is a pause in fighting in Gaza. Gallant added that the IDF will not adhere to a unilateral Hezbollah ceasefire as it did during the November pause in Gaza fighting. ILTV's Steve Leibowitz reported on the Northern Front. Visiting the IDF Northern Command, Defense Minister Gallant said Israel will increase its strikes on Hezbollah in response to its daily attacks on northern Israel. Gallant said that even if there is a pause in fighting in Gaza, the IDF will continue pounding terrorist positions in Lebanon. Gallant said Hezbollah cannot find replacements for commanders killed by IDF strikes. The cross-border Hezbollah attacks have been continuing. Several rockets were fired at northern Israel after an attack on a Hezbollah truck 
near the stronghold of Homs, close to the Lebanese-Syrian border. All of the rockets landed in open areas. There were no reports of damage or injuries. Shortly after the strike, the Iranian-backed Lebanese terror group Hezbollah announced that two of its operatives were killed. The IDF says it struck a Hezbollah cell that was spotted coming out of a building known to be used by the terror group in the southern Lebanese town of Blida. Another two buildings were struck by fighter jets in the same area. Recent attacks brought the terror group's death toll since the beginning of the war in the Gaza Strip to 214. Meanwhile, bad news for residents of the north. The government is now expected to extend the evacuation order for the 60,000 residents of the northern border areas until at least July. The prime minister's office is reportedly considering to push that date even further until August, raising expectations for a war against Hezbollah this summer. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. With the Northern Front in a continued state of war thanks to Hezbollah, a proxy of the Islamic Republic of Iran, there's no question that this regime in Iran is itching for conflict with Israel. Here to speak with us about the role of Iran in this war is Jonathan Shanzer from Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us today. Just to start, we've seen continuous low-level escalation on the Northern Front with the proxy of the regime itself, Hezbollah. Is Iran just biding its time in this conflict? That's a good question, Emily. I think we're trying to figure out exactly what the intentions of the regime are right now. Just to be clear, what's happening in Lebanon is not a low-level conflict. I mean, the, we are talking about hundreds and hundreds of attacks, including some direct hits on Israeli military targets. And so the Israelis are now uh, attacking deeper and deeper into Lebanon itself, taking out strategic assets belonging to Hezbollah. And that all begs the question, what does Iran want? Is Iran trying to activate Hezbollah so that there is a second front that Israel has to fight alongside what's going on in Gaza? By the way, that doesn't even get to the attacks that we've seen against American forces uh, by Shiite militias in Iraq and Syria, and of course, what the Houthis are doing in Yemen. We call this the ring of fire strategy, and that is clear. This is what the Iranian regime has activated. They have definitely deployed that ring of fire. But I think there are questions now about whether this is all designed to destroy Israel, right, where they're trying to, car can, you know, to carry out attacks continuously from all angles, or whether this is a distraction from something much more insidious, which would be, of course, the, uh, the, a dash to a nuclear weapon. And right now, it's very difficult to discern what's what. Now, do you believe that there is a, a wide-scale plan on the part of the Iranian regime to commit further massacres, similar to October 7th, whether against Israel or, or against the Western world? And, and what can be done to prevent it? Well, for sure, I think the capabilities are there as it relates to Hezbollah, the so-called Radwan forces that are active primarily in southern Lebanon. Uh, this has been the fear of Israel since October 7th, that Hezbollah could carry out an attack similar or perhaps even worse than what we saw on October 7th at the hands of Hamas. Uh, and their uh, and, and their ground forces. So that is something that we continue to watch. The drone attacks and the rocket attacks by the Shiite militias, I think, may be the extent of it as we see their ability to attack the West. But I would argue that what we're seeing out of the Houthis right now is potentially even more worrying than any of the above, because what they've done is they've shut off uh, the shipping lanes in the Red Sea. There are reports today of attacks on the communications cables between uh, the Middle East and Africa, which is now having an impact on Europe as well. Uh, this is having a significant economic impact and, of course, the security impact that has forced the U.S., the U.K., the Israelis and others to get involved. Now, when it comes to the Houthis, as you've mentioned several times, we've seen some disturbing demonstrations, even in the West, of people chanting in support 
of the Houthis. Now, we know the Iranian regime has been very active on the cyber front as well. Do you see this activity as something connected to the Iranian regime in any sort of formal way? Or is this more a war of information that, that Iran is waging through media and social media in order to advance the interests of the regime? I think it's both. I mean, to be honest, we can see an information operation that the Iranians have been running since day one, uh, where they're trying to pull together what they would call their axis of resistance in the media space, right? Not just the terrorist groups that they coordinate, but also all the different, uh, you know, uh, supporters uh, and backers of the regime, the Islamists around the world. By the way, Muslim Brotherhood, which is the largest Islamist group in the world, they're pretty much behind the regime in Iran, uh, despite those sectarian differences, despite that Sunni-Shiite divide. Uh, and so what they're trying to do right now, from what we can tell, is to organize uh, with one voice all of this opposition to Israel and to the United States, while also coordinating the violent activities of these groups. And they're getting that support on college campuses, on Main Street America, in European capitals. And obviously, they're doing a pretty good job of it. And it's, uh, it's real cause for concern. So Israel and the U.S. have both struck Iranian targets throughout the Middle East, in particular in, in Syria and Iraq. Are these strikes sufficient to deter the regime? And if not, what must the, the Western allied countries will say, what must they do? Well, it's a good question. I mean, actually, since the uh, Iranian proxies out of Iraq were able to successfully target three servicemen in Jordan, the U.S. announced that it was going to respond. And then it did and took out a number of targets associated with both militias in Iraq and Syria. And since that time, we've actually seen uh, a quieting of both fronts, which I think is actually a very positive sign. I'm not sure that it's going to last in perpetuity. I'm fairly certain we're going to see these two proxy fronts heat up again. There's about a dozen and a half different uh, Shiite militias aligned with Iran, and the odds of them staying quiet are quite low. But I think the bigger question is, how do you deter the Houthis, right? They're the ones that continue to carry out the more serious of these attacks. And what I think all of this shows is that the regime has multiple tools that it can deploy against the West, against Israel, against the wider forces of the region in favor of stability and pragmatism. And right now, the U.S. seems to not have a lot of answers. The Iranians seem to be dominating this space, and uh, even with the curbing of some of that violence out of Iraq and Syria, it looks as if we've lost control of the region. And this is a major concern for the United States. Well, Jonathan Shanzer, Foundation for Defense of Democracies, thank you so much for your insight. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Disturbing scenes from Washington, D.C., where a man identified as Aaron Bushnell, 25, self-immolated outside the Israeli embassy in protest of what he called the genocide in Gaza. Bushnell, who was 25, was an active duty member of the U.S. Air Force and was in uniform when he self-immolated. He is reported to have died of his injuries. Bushnell recorded himself walking to the embassy, stating what he was about to do, and then shouting free Palestine before setting himself on fire. Israeli security rushed to the scene with fire extinguishers and called an ambulance to treat him. Bushnell was rushed to the hospital, but later died of injuries sustained in the incident. A video of the ordeal was live-streamed by Bushnell on Twitch, and subsequently shared across all social media. After Brazil's President Lula made incendiary comments about Israel, the Brazilian people are responding and showing their support for Israel. Let's take a closer look. Tens of thousands of Brazilians took to the streets in Sao Paulo for a rally in defiance of Brazilian President Lula's comments comparing Israel's war against Hamas to the Holocaust. Lula's comments were harshly condemned, and Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz summoned the Brazilian ambassador in response, taking him to Yad Vashem and demanding an apology from Lula. Former President Bolsonaro, a staunch supporter of Israel, attended the rally in Brazil where he was seen waving an Israeli flag in solidarity. Many of the attendees were his staunch supporters. Bolsonaro has come under fire in the past year after losing the election and is currently being investigated by federal police for his role in the attacks on government buildings by his supporters following his election loss. Many of his supporters believe this election was stolen. Nonetheless, six blocks of Paulista Avenue were filled with his supporters yesterday, approximately 185,000 attendees, with thousands of Israeli flags clearly in sight to send a strong message against Lula's anti-Israel policies. 
Among the signs visible in the rally were those that read, Brazilians want to tell the Jewish people that we are sorry. CNN Brazil reported that 83 percent of Brazilians polled strongly disagreed with President Lula's anti-Semitic comments. While Bolsonaro is ineligible to run for office again until 2030 due to his convictions of abuse of power, his supporters remain extremely outspoken and active, including on the issue of Israel. Well, even as Israel battles Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah on the northern front, democracy doesn't wait. Tomorrow, municipal elections will take place throughout the country. Let's take a closer look. Israeli municipal elections are finally taking place after two postponements due to the war. Tomorrow's elections will select mayors and local council heads in 197 municipalities and 44 local councils. Over 24,000 candidates are running for public office on 4,500 party slates. However, of the 801 candidates for mayor, only 83 are women. Voters will cast ballots for both the head of the regional council of their choice as well as a council slate. In the case of cities which have been evacuated due to the war, both in the north and south, special elections will be held nine months from now on November 19th. Some 180,000 Israelis who have been displaced will be eligible to vote in the November 19th election. All other municipalities will be chosen tomorrow by 7 million eligible Israeli voters, including nearly half a million votes away from their respective municipalities due to the large number of soldiers serving in Gaza and on the northern front. Due to the security situation, the Israeli government has prepared to conduct security evaluations every two hours, and in the event of escalation, could even halt the election and postpone yet again to a later date. Just as in national elections, Election Day is a holiday in Israel in order to encourage Israelis to head to the polls. However, turnout is hard to predict this year, given the security situation. Coming tomorrow, ILTV's new show, Viewpoint, in which we take you inside the Israel-Gaza war to hear from stakeholders, thought leaders, and decision makers. Our premiere episode will be tomorrow and will feature renowned author and journalist Douglas Murray. Douglas has been a leading voice throughout the Israel-Gaza war, having spent weeks speaking to survivors, former hostages, IDF officials, and even Prime Minister Netanyahu. Douglas has also been one of the most outspoken voices of sanity in the international media when it comes to the extreme accusations lobbed against Israel. Tune in tomorrow for the exclusive interview. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Partly cloudy skies are expected around most of the country tonight with lows of around 6 degrees Celsius or 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow we will see the skies clear up alongside steady top temperatures, seeing highs of about 14 degrees Celsius or 57 degrees Fahrenheit. That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channels, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.TV, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Emily Schrader. Be well, and thank you so much for watching.